Welcome to Acts chapter 4. Um, Acts chapter 4 is going to go pretty quick. I went pretty quick at church last night. Uh, I actually got done a little bit early, and I think uh, a lot of people are happy about that. Because uh, I have a tendency to run long, it seems like, these days. I never thought that, uh, never in my life would I ever have considered myself to be a long-winded person. But uh, among a lot of other things that's changed in my life since coming to Jesus, that that seems to have changed too. So they were happy about it, and you know it's it's a uh, it's a good it's a good chapter. It's, uh, it comes after. I remember last week uh, Peter and John had uh, healed a lame man and offered him uh, healing in the name of Jesus, and upset some people in in, uh, in the temple, and um, they had to get locked up at night, and we're going to deal here in chapter four. We're going to deal with the aftermath of this, and uh, again, also in chapter five, they get in trouble again, get locked up again, um, and then in chapter six, uh, we have uh, coming up. I'm working up to, towards uh, next week, Lord willing. Uh, the plan is five and six. Do five and six both next week. And then after that uh, is chapter 7, which is, of course, the greatest sermon ever preached um, since Jesus, uh, Acts chapter 7, Stephen's sermon. And uh, I, don't, I don't see how we can do that in one. I'm, I'm ex expecting that to be a couple of weeks. And then, and then after that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break from this and I'm going to do a... Uh, I'm going to do a, a session just on the Apostle Paul, uh, just just some things about Paul. Uh, we're going to be dealing with Paul after chapter seven. We're going to be dealing exclusively with Paul uh, for the rest of the, for the remainder of the book and and uh, the, you know things that surrounded him. So we're going to it's naturally going to be Paul's going to be in the studies as we go along. But uh, but I'd like to do a uh, just a personal, uh, a personal study in in, in the Paul himself. So uh, that's the plan. And uh, if anybody knows the truth about my plans, a lot of times they get waylaid. I may have an agenda, but I end up laying my agenda down, and I do it willingly. But I'm just saying that's that's the plan that up here. But. You know what 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 I contrive up here is not always what exactly what God wants me to do. So that's the plan: is uh, this week four, five and six next week, and then uh, chapter seven in the study of Paul. So, uh, like I said, uh, Peter and John got in trouble, and uh, we're going to pick up here uh, kind of uh, where they left off. Uh, Peter preached the sermon, and uh, at the end of uh, at the end of chapter three. It left them, and, and in chapter four, we're going to deal with what happened afterward. And remember, they're at the temple. It's uh, it's very, it's very, uh, it's very intriguing. It's very important to realize that they're they're doing this thing. At, they're still going to the temple. They're still going to God's house. They're 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 trying to show the people of God's house first what's wrong with the way they're thinking. They're trying to show them the truth. They're trying to teach them the truth. They're trying to bring the gospel of Jesus to the temple first, which is exactly what happened the first time. Uh, remember, remember in the study of Ezekiel, uh, we had we had in chapter uh, nine, I think if I may be mistaken, but we had a chapter that dealt with uh, the man dressed in white linen with the ink horn. And God told Ezekiel to tell that man to start at my house, start at the temple. And to go around and mark the people in the city who were still sighing for the temple, or in other words, the people who were still calling on God's name, the people who were still trusting in Jehovah God to take care of them, the ones that hadn't turned their backs on God, because this is what he's dealing with here: people that have turned their backs on God. He's going to uh, Peter later on in chapter four is going to quote uh, Psalms chapter two. And that's exactly what he's saying. That's, that's exactly what Psalms chapter 2 is saying, that the people, we don't want God anymore. That's what Peter's trying to, and he's doing it in the temple. He's doing it in God's house. Because he's starting right there. <clears throat> because judgment starts at the house of God, the Bible says that over and over again. So uh, we should, uh, and another thing, you know, we're going to, uh, well, let's just get into it. Uh, chapter 4, to start in verse 1. And as they spake, Unto the people, the priests, 
And the captain of the temple, which were the Roman guards and the Sadducees, came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Now remember in the Gospels, as, we go, as you go through the Gospels, remember the primary group that came up against Jesus were the Pharisees. They were the lawyers. They were the legal keepers of the law. They were the lawyers. They were the people who, when you had a question about something in the law, that's who you went to. When you needed to know exactly what the law said concerning a very, very specific thing, and, and, and they were lawyers. They do exactly then, they did exactly then what lawyers do today. They speak to the letter of the law. They, 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 were, they were the lawyers, and they were the ones that were, they were the primary people who were coming up against Jesus because Jesus was speaking law. He was speaking with authority and he was bringing a whole different understanding to the law than what they were used to being. And he was doing it with authority and he was also doing it with signs and miracles and wonders that were backing up what he was saying. And they could not, the lawyers for the life of them could not box him in or paint him into a corner to save their neck, they couldn't do it. And they, those were the, 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 the opponents of Jesus. The Sadducees, the, the, the biggest difference in the Pharisees and the Sadducees, because the Sadducees are lawyers also, but the Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection. They don't believe in miracles. They don't believe in the afterlife. They don't believe in the resurrection. They believe that we live godly, righteous lives here on this earth, and, and that's it, pretty much. When it's over, it's over. They don't believe in a resurrection or a coming back. Any of those things. They're, 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 they're not materialists. They don't believe in, in, in any of those things. Much like the people of today. People of today don't believe in a resurrection. But, but because Peter and John and the apostles, the, 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 the people who are pre the preachers, the new church, the, the message they were preaching, the gospel that they were spreading, centers around and has everything to do with the resurrection of Jesus. And since the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection in any, way, in any form or, or shape of all, that, that not only did they not believe that Jesus was resurrected from the dead, they don't believe in anybody is going to be resurrected in the future. So because they're preaching the resurrection of Jesus here, and, and, and the resurrection of Jesus is the foundation which the gospel of Christ is built on, well, naturally, the Sadducees are now, the, they're going to be the opponent that's out in the forefront. So we're going to hear a lot more about, as we go through the book of Acts, we're going to hear a lot more about Sadducees than we do Pharisees. Whereas in the Gospels, we heard a lot more about Pharisees than Sadducees. Now, mind you, they were, they were mentioned a lot together. But, 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 but primarily, the, fact, the Pharisees, the lawyers, came against Jesus and, and the Sadducees, who are, who are lawyers also. But they're coming against him because they're preaching the resurrection. They're preaching a resurrected man. And they didn't believe in that. And, and not only are they preaching it, but now they've got signs and wonders backing him up because this man that got healed, that everybody knew was lame, they can't, they can't deny it. We get to that later on. They can't, there's no way they can deny it. So here these people are preaching against their teaching and what they believe, and they're backing it up. And see, they thought they got rid of this. They thought they'd snuffed this out. They thought when they killed Jesus that they had wiped this little thing out, that it would go away, that it wouldn't be a hindrance to them anymore. But lo and behold, here's these guys coming back, and, and the other guy that they killed is gone. They don't know where because they don't believe he's resurrected, so they don't, they're, they're not really concerned with where he is. They're just concerned that it, with, with, they're just happy that he's not around anymore. But then, here comes all this other, this whole group of people now that are using his name to bring the miracles back. Oh, and it's, and it's upset them. It's upset them something fierce. So here they are, in verse 1, as they spake to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came unto them and came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them, or they arrested them, and they put them in hold, or they put them in jail until the next day. For it was now eventide. Now, remember when the lame man, in chapter 3, it says uh, in verse 1, it says, Peter and John went up together into the temple in the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour, which is 3 p.m. So now here at eventime, they got to lock them up in jail and wait till the next day. So what does that mean? It's getting close to six. It's getting close to six o'clock.
So we got about three hours that passed by from the time the guy got lame, the guy, the lame guy, got healed. They made their way into the up onto Solomon's porch, and Peter preached his sermon. <coughs> and uh, so he preached, and now they've come and to stop him, and it's at even time. So it's getting close to six o'clock. It's getting close to the end of the day. Remember, remember the day, the, the Jewish day went from 6 to 6. 6 p.m. was the end of the day. After that, it was evening. It was, it, it was evening time. So, so it's close to 6. So my point I'm trying to get at here is, is Peter, this sermon, that we, you know, we read it last week. Uh, we read all the scriptures you know, that he spoke pretty much uh, just in a few minutes. But apparently Peter preached about three hours. He's been about three because it's been about three hours since this guy got healed, and and they immediately went on up into Solomon's porch and he began teaching, and the guy was jumping and praising God, and they were all you know praising God for what had happened to this lame man. So here, about close to three hours later, it, you know they finally arrested him to get him off the Temple Mount because it's getting to the end of the time, getting to the end of the night. Um, how many of us have ever spent three hours in church? How many of us have ever listened to a three-hour sermon? I'm not saying he preached for three hours, but it's close to it. How many of us paid attention? Because it plainly says here that there's a whole bunch of people heard what he said, and a whole bunch of people believed on what he said, and they got saved. They heard the message. But Peter preached a pretty long sermon. And we go to church. You know, we, we show up at church. at, 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 at our, our church starts at 11. We show up at church at, at 5 minutes to 11, and we walk in the door looking at our watches. And, and, and you know, as soon as preaching's over, if you stand too close to the door, you might get your foot stepped on as people get out. And that's not just my church, that's every church. That's all churches everywhere because, because that's, that's because we're humans. We're humans. It's, it's our flesh. It's our, it's our nature. Our nature, it's not our nature to conform to the gospel. It's not our nature to, 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 to go and adhere to things like this. That, that's not, we, we have to fight our flesh and our nature constantly, every single day in everything because of the simple fact that we are human beings. And we must always, always take heed to the fact that we're humans and we have to watch every single thing that we do, everything. Verse 4, how be it, or in spite of it, in spite of being shut up, in spite of being arrested and taken away, in spite of everybody running up the guards and the priests and, and everybody. Now, mind you, Deuteronomy 13, I'm not going to read it, uh, uh, but, uh, but I would... Uh, I would strongly suggest you go and read Deuteronomy 13. But Deuteronomy 13 explains that we are to be very wary and questionable. I mean, Deuteronomy 13 says that <clears throat> says that not only should we not hear false prophets, because we know false prophets by the things they say don't come true, but Deuteronomy 13 explains to us that if we hear a prophet say something and it comes true, and we heed what that prophet says, but he is enticing us away from the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We're going to die. We're responsible. We're responsible to listen to and to mark what people say and to know that what they're saying is biblical and scriptural. And how can you do that? If you don't know the Bible and you don't know the Scriptures, how can you question the man who is presenting something to you? How can you know that I'm not telling you absolute bald-faced lies sitting right here in my chair in my living room unless you go and get your Bible and back up, look up, and verify what the Bible says about what I'm saying? Because Acts 7, 11, uh, 7... Somewhere in Acts 17, 11, I believe it says, it talks about the Bereans and, and the, the, the Thessalonians. And they said that the Bereans were more honorable above the others because not only did they hear the Word of God, but they searched the Scriptures to see that it was true. So we have a responsibility. And what I'm saying is these priests, they were well within their rights. They were well within their rights to come in question because they were, after all, they were in the temple. These are temple guards and priests of the temple and the Sadducees who are half of the Sanhedrin who is, who is the, the law, the, the, the Supreme Court, if you will. 
They were within their rights according to Deuteronomy 13. It's just that they didn't accept what Peter was saying and John was saying and Jesus was saying. They didn't understand. They didn't know the truth. They didn't see the truth for what it was. They didn't understand that this is the truth. They understood that their version of the truth and they were stubborn and hard-headed and they, they concluded that their version of the truth was the actual truth and these people needed to be put to shame mainly because they're preaching resurrection and that puts the Sadducees, that puts them out of business <laughs> right off, the, I mean right away right away, you know, if, if Peter and John are right in what they're saying the Sadducees in their minds are thinking if these, if these boys are right, we're out of business buddy we're out, we're, it's, it's not, we're, our game's over our whole belief system is wrong because we don't believe in the resurrection. But if they're preaching the truth and what they're saying is true, then we're out of business. We're gone. We're out the door. So that naturally they're going to get upset and they're not going to see the truth willingly. I mean, I mean, they're not going to easily. Some of them, some of them, no doubt did, but it wasn't an easy thing. Verse four: Howbeit, many of them which heard the word believed. So he got, he, you know, Isaiah 55 and 11 says, my, vo my, my word will not return unto me void, God said. My word is going to go out where it's supposed to go, and it's going to do what I intended for it to do, and it's not going to return unto me void or empty. It's going to accomplish that which I want it to accomplish. That's what Isaiah 55 and 11 says. So here it says, in spite of being locked up and dragged down and took away, many people uh, heard and they believed, and the number was then about 5,000. So now we're up to, we've got a couple thousand people that heard Peter preach that day and, and, and got saved. They heard the word, they heard the gospel, and they were pricked in their hearts. And they asked themselves, what should I do? They already said, what, what shall we do? And they asked them, what, what do we do? They get saved. It worked. And it came to pass on the morrow, verse 5, that the rulers and elders and the scribes and Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. Now, understand what, the, what it is on the morrow they've been brought before the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was 71 men, 71 old men with beards and robes and sticks and staffs and all kind of outward. Their phylacteries were the border. Jesus said the borders, their, their clothes were adorned to the max. They, they, had, they had adornments that they wore on their head. They had their boxes on their forehead. They would have their, all their little boxes and cubes with scriptures rolled up tied in their sleeves and all the stripes and the colors representing how long they'd been and who they were and what tribe. All that presence of authority all decked out and all those, all, 71 of them sitting there in a circle in a circle. And when you went before the Sanhedrin, you went as you stood in the middle of that circle. And you had all of these eyes, these 142 eyes, bearing down on you. Don't tell me the pressure wasn't on. It was, it, it was a very pressured situation. They were brought and they were set in the midst, it says here. They were brought and they were put in the middle of this big roundhouse of power, if you will to be judged by these men, to be heard and judged, because that's what they did. That's what the Sanhedrin did. Now, let's go and read in John chapter 18 before we go any further, because we're going to see a transformation here in Peter like you don't get to see very often in the Bible. And what we're going to do is we're going to go back over here to John chapter 18 to the night Jesus got drug out of the garden and he got brought and put in the same situation except it was in the middle of the night so it was considered an emergency meeting so it took place at a man's house now remember we got Annas the high priest and this is in Acts chapter 4 Annas the high priest and Caiaphas John and Alexander and as many as of were the kindred of the high priest. Yes, the Sanhedrin was eat up with nepotism. They were all related to or knew each other very well. They were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst. Now, let's flip back over here to John chapter 18. And let's read verses uh, starting in verse 12. <clears throat> then the band and the captain and officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him and led him away to Annas first. Annas, same guy. 
to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law to Caiaphas, same guy. Remember, this is, you know, this night here, it was the night before Jesus was, it was the night before Jesus was crucified. So, so you're talking here, we're talking three months, less than three months later. So it's the same group, it's the same bunch. Led him away to Annas first, for, uh, for he was the father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. Now Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. Caiaphas was one that spoke up and said, we want Barabbas. That's what he's saying here. Because every year, remember Pilate said every year it's a tradition <clears throat> that we release a prisoner to you because it's your most important holiday. It's the Passover. So, so who do you want? You want Jesus? Because because Caiaphas spoke up and says we need one man. We get one man released to us. You want Jesus or you want Barabbas? Oh, we want Barabbas. We want the murderer. That's that, that's what this verse is relating to. And here in chapter in verse fourteen, verse fifteen, and Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. That disciple was known unto the high priest and went in with Jesus into the palace of the high priest. Now remember, John always talks about himself this way. He's referring to himself. Because he always refers to that, that disciple whom Jesus loved. He's talking about himself. He, he don't use his own name. Verse 16, But Peter stood at the door without, then went out to the other disciple, then went out that other disciple, which was known unto the high priest, and spake unto her that kept the door, and brought in Peter. Then saith the damsel that kept the door unto Peter, Art not thou also one of this man's disciples? And he saith, I am not first time. No, I'm not. He said, I'm not, I'm not with those people. It's the first time he denied him. And the servants and officers stood there <clears throat> who made a fire of coals, for it was cold. And they warmed themselves, and Peter stood with them, and he warmed himself. He was on the outside looking in now. Then, high, then the high priest then asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine. And Jesus answered him and said, I spake openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple, where the Jews always resort, and in secret have I said nothing. Why askest thou me? Ask them which heard me what I've said unto them. Behold, they know what I said. He's saying, I ain't never, I, I ain't never kept nothing secret. I've taught right where you people are supposed to be. I've been in your temple. I've been in your synagogues. I ain't held back nothing. And I, everybody, everything that I've ever said has been heard by many people. Ask them. Don't ask me. Ask them. That's what he's saying. And when he had thus spoken, verse 22, one of the officers which stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Answerest thou the high priest so? And Jesus said, answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why spitest thou me? Tell me if I've said anything wrong. If I hadn't said anything wrong, why are you hitting me? I ain't said anything wrong, he said. Now Annas had sent him bound unto Caiaphas, the high priest. And Simon Peter stood up, uh, stood and warmed himself. <clears throat> they said therefore unto him, Art not thou also one of his disciples? And he denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, being the kinsman, whose ear Peter had cut off, saith, Did not I see thee in the garden with him? Then Peter denied again, and immediately the cock crew. Peter was a sniveling, Wimping out, don't want to say nothing, don't want to be recognized, backwards, wanted to get away from the situation. That's what he was all about this night. Leave me alone. I'm not one of these people. Leave me. Don't keep asking me questions. Don't keep coming to me. I'm just standing here by this barrel trying to stay warm. Y'all leave me alone. I ain't one of them. Three times he denied him, just like Jesus told him he was going to. Now, here in Acts chapter 4, we see the same Peter. We see the same high priest. We see the same father-in-law. And we got a bunch of other names that weren't listed here, but I guarantee you, over here in John chapter 18, I guarantee you these other names, these John and Alexander, and these other names that are mentioned here, I promise you they were here. Because they're part of this group. They were at Caiaphas' house. And over here we got the same group of men. And what we want to pay attention to now is the difference in the way Peter was that night. Three months later, filled, powered, indwelled with the Holy Ghost. 
bold witnessing for Jesus. Look at the difference. Same group of men, same kind of situation, but we're going to see a big, big difference in, in John. Verse 7, And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? By what name? It's funny they ask by what name. They want to know who they're, who, who they're operating with. Uh, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but, you know, Gamaliel in, in chapter 5 brings up, you know, the fact that, you know, he brings up and he mentions another name that we have no idea who that person is because that person is lost to history. And that's exactly why Gamaliel brought that, brought that name up. But he, what he basically what he's saying is, you know, there's little upstarts. These men, you know, and we see them today. We have these people in the world today. They'll stand up and they'll say, I got a secret. And, and, and I, I promise you, you can stand on the street corner and proclaim something long enough and you'll get a little following. You'll have some people say, hey, he's right. Y'all come listen to what he's saying. He, I don't care what you're talking about. You can get some people to follow you. And it's either going to come to something or it's not. That's what they're saying. They want to know by whose name. Are you, who are you representing? What power? What power have you asked? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost. Here we go. Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost. Verse 8. Said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel. And you know, remember where he's talking? Remember he's standing in the middle of these, these men, bearing down, he's looking at him. High pressure stuff. If we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all. Now listen to this, verse 10. Be it known unto you all <clears throat> and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, Peter never missed an opportunity when he was standing before men, he was standing before rulers, elders, didn't matter who he was talking to. He never missed an opportunity to let them know they had killed the Lamb of Life. They had killed the one who came <clears throat> to take their sins away. He never cut them any slack, ever. <clears throat> no matter what kind of position or they held or who they were. He didn't cut any slack. This is this is kind of akin to, I was, I was thinking about this the other day, and, and I, I thought, you know, this is kind of like if me and a friend of mine Went all busting up into Bob Jones University up in Greenville, South Carolina. Went in there and tell them, you know, because y'all are Baptists, y'all are all going to hell because you're believing a lie. It'd be this, it's the same kind of thing. Peter is standing before the leaders of the nation of Israel telling them that you're, not only are you wrong about what you think, but you have killed with your own hands, you have killed the one who was sent here to save you and show you the right way. He never missed an opportunity to get that in. And what do we hear in church today? Don't, don't, brother, don't, oh, don't say things. No, you can't talk about stuff. No, don't say things like, you're going to hurt somebody's feelings. You're going to get somebody upset. You're going to make somebody mad. You're going to fix it so that nobody's going to like you anymore. <clears throat> if it's good enough for the first century church, sin, and the retribution of God, the wrath of God, the justice of God, the judgment of God, the righteousness of God, the holiness of God, the sovereignty of God. If it's good enough for the first century church, it ought to be good enough for the 21st century church. And that's exactly why you don't have preachers preaching sermons in the 21st century church and 2,000 or 3,000 or 5,000 people are getting saved and coming to Jesus. The only way you can do that is to present the offensiveness of the cross and the wickedness of sin to people who are involved in the activities that are sinful. Don't hurt nobody's feelings. Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, sticking it to the Sadducees there, even by him, 
does this man stand here before you whole? He, they know who, he knows they know who Jesus was. He don't have to explain to them who Jesus was. He's not presenting somebody to them that's unknown to them that they wouldn't recognize his name. I promise you they recognize his name. I promise you that the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth burns in their minds when they lay down to sleep at night. If you could go back and sit down and talk with Annas and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and any of these other people now, and they would be truthful to you, they would tell you that they couldn't sleep at night because of the name Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Of Nazareth. So Peter's not presenting them to somebody they never heard of or don't know nothing about. He's telling them what they already know. He's telling them that they killed the Lamb of God. You crucified He's not cutting them any slack. He's not worried about hurting nobody's feelings. He's not worried about offending anybody. He's not worried about any of them getting mad and getting up and walking out on him. He's not worried about that at all. Oh, not only that, he's not worried about any of them getting up and cutting his head off either. Because he is right bud sure in what he thinks and what he knows because he tells them, I know. I can, speak only the, I can speak only the things to you which I've seen and heard and know, he said. He tells them. <clears throat> Verse 11. This is the stone which was set at naught of the builders, which has become the head of the corner. Now again, he goes to the Torah. He goes to the Psalms. He goes and he shares something with them that he knows that they're going to understand and recognize because he's quoting David. Look in Psalms 118. I should have all these places marked in my Bible where I'm going to turn to when I'm reading this, but then y'all wouldn't get the joy of sitting there watching me fumble through my Bible if I did that. Psalms 118, verse 22 and 23. The stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It's God's doing. It's, this is Jehovah's doing. It's God's doing. It is marvelous. In our eyes, David said. So he's quoting Psalms. I mean, he's quoting David. So they would all, Sadducee or Pharisee, they would recognize David. They would know. They know their Torah. They know their Psalms. They know their prophets. They know their Proverbs. Guaranteed. They would know exactly what he was saying to them. But he's also quoting the one that they put to death in Matthew 21. Matthew 21, verse 42. It's in red letters, in case you don't have a red letter Bible. Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the Scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same is become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. He said, Have you never read that before? Do you not understand what's going on? Can you not recognize what is laid out before you here? That's what Jesus tried over and over. He stood out the day he rode into town on a donkey. He stood outside the city and wept and cried. And he said, oh, Jerusalem, if you had only have paid attention, if you only knew, if you could only understand, if you would only recognize who I am, how often, how often would I have gathered you to myself? just like a hen gathers her chicks. If you could only know, have you not ever read in the Scriptures? That's what he's saying to them. Have you not ever read in the Scriptures? Verse 43 is kind of sad. After he makes that statement to them, he, he goes on and in verse 43 and he says, Therefore, so because of this, because you act like you don't know or you just rejecting the truth or don't want to know the truth about it, because this stone, this rejected stone, has become the head corner, the chief cornerstone, the foundation, the rock, Christ Jesus. Because of that, therefore, say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. That's what Jesus said. Uh, what did he teach them in the parable of the talents? If you can't do something with what I give you, if you can't take it, if you didn't know you knew I was that kind of man, 
And you knew when I left and come back that I was going to expect you to have been doing something while I'm gone. Listen to that, church. He expects us to be busy doing something while he's gone. He left us with a little bit, and he expects us to turn that little bit into a whole lot. How are we going to do that? Because the guy in the parable buried his in the ground. He hid it away and he said, I knew you was a ruthless man. And I knew when you came back and I didn't have nothing left, you was going to be upset. That's what he was saying. So I buried it. Now here, he's all happy about it. He said, here, here's what you left me with. I took good care of it while you was gone. And what did Jesus say to him? Look, pal, I gave you this expecting you to turn it into something else. You said you knew that's what I was expecting. So I'm taking you at your word. I'm taking you at your own word that you knew what you were supposed to do and you willfully, willingly, and purposely rejected what I asked you to do. So now I'm going to, not only am I going to, do you not get anything of this over here, I'm going to take away what you already have. So he's telling them right here, because you rejected that stone, because you rejected the stone that was cut out of the mountain, because you rejected that stone, I'm going to take the kingdom of God and I'm going to give it to a nation. In another place, he says, I'm going to give it to a nation that's not even a nation. Why? Because they'll make some fruit out of it. They're going to do something with it. They're going to have for return. When I, when I give it to them and I go away and I come back, I'm going to have more than I had to begin with. That's what I'm looking for. Jesus said he came to save us so that we would produce fruit and that fruit remain. That's what he's talking about. Work, work, busy. What are we working at? We're working at not hurting anybody's feelings. And by working at not hurting anybody's feelings and not offending anybody, we're working at destroying the kingdom of God because nobody's coming to the knowledge of the truth. Because we're not spreading the truth. We're spreading a look good, feel good version of it. The Bible says God don't respect anybody over anybody for position, for wealth, for whatever, for nothing. He don't respect anybody's person. God does not love anybody more or less than he loves everybody. Period. How on earth, how on earth can we look at ourselves in the mirror and smile and say, God is blessing me because I've got this and they ain't. What do you hear? Favor. People put that on my Facebook all the time. God's showing you favor. Really? Because the Bible tells me He don't favor anybody. Because we've rejected the truth. If we reject that truth, if God, because an entire, because they rejected the truth of His Son, if He took the blessings of being the chosen children of God away from them, why do we think that He won't chastise us and take things away from us? I just don't. I don't get it. And I'm saying all that in relate not 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 in relation to material things because material things are a very big part of it. But I'm saying all that because the church needs to come alive. The church needs to wake up. The church needs to get a grip on itself. The church needs to come to the understanding that God loves them dirty, nasty, stinking people on the other side of the earth that are getting their heads cut off for the name of Jesus. He loves them just as much as he loves you sitting in your air-conditioned house in your brand new clothes smelling real good where you just got out of the shower and you've got on perfume and you're looking out the window at your brand new car in the driveway. Them people that are dying with their heads cut off in the dirt are just as beloved in the eyes of God as you are or as I am or as anybody else on the earth is. The church has got to get away from thinking that God loves me and blesses me because 
I'm better than they are. It's a shame and it's an atrocity and it's a disgrace what's going on on the other side of the world. But it ain't slowed the TV preachers down one bit. It ain't slowed them down for one second. It ain't stopped them from selling one prophecy DVD. It ain't stopped them from selling one single sermon CD telling them how the favor of God is raining and showering blessings of $100 bills all over you. It ain't slowed them down a bit. We're preaching prosperity over here and the church the bride of Christ is getting her head cut off by the thousands over here. Tell me that's logical. Tell me that makes sense. Why can't you look at that and say that is a ludicrous viewpoint of a righteous and holy God? God don't love you more than somebody else simply because you've got a lot of stuff. Because truth be known, most of that stuff comes with a payment book. And I promise you, if something is a gift from God that comes with a payment book, that's not a gift from God. That's bondage. That's bondage because you are in bondage to somebody else for a sum of What do you think bondage is? What do you think indentured servitude is? I owe a, man A owes man B X amount of money. So man A is going to work for man B for free till X amount of money is paid off. That's known as indentured servitude. When God gives you a car that comes with a payment book, that's indentured servitude. Think about it. Be honest. Think, honestly think about the logic of the way we think. We're all caught up in this. We're all, we're all, we, we have this beaten into us, bombarded into us every day. Think about it. Think of the logic or the illogic that comes out of that way of thinking, that kind of treachery, that kind of doctrine. It's wrong. Sorry about that. No, I'm not actually, I'm not sorry. I did not mean to go there. Anyway, this is the stone which was set at naught of you builders which has become the head of the corner. Again, he's telling them again, you did this, you set this at naught, you crucified this man. Neither is there, verse 12, neither is there salvation in any other. None, any, none. There is no salvation in any other. What does that mean? You can't get saved any other way. Well, what does that mean? If you don't go to heaven by the way of the blood of Jesus Christ who died for your sins and was resurrected and sits at the right hand of the Father today. If you don't abide by His rules and His commandments and His judgments that He left behind for us to adhere to, if you're trying to get there any other way, you will go to hell. That's what the church needs to tell people. You can't get there any other way. No, uh, there is no, there is salvation in any other. There's none, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name. None. And, and, and mind you now, he's talking to the Sanhedrin, so he's, in, he, he's by implication, he's saying that includes Moses and the law. There is no salvation in Moses and the law anymore because Christ the Messiah has come, the promised Messiah has come, and you killed him. None other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. You can find religion. You can find religion all day long. There's religion in, there's religion in Buddha. There's religion in, 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 in the Indian gods and, and the worship of elephants. And cats. There's religion in all those things. There's religion in the Jehovah's Witnesses. There's religion in Mormonism. There's religion in all these things, but there ain't no salvation. Well, how can you say that, brother? Because they ain't got Jesus. They don't want Jesus, and they have rejected all of these other religions, have rejected Jesus. Well, they mention him, but he's just really a non-important, non-vital part. They've taken his deity away. They've taken whatever, whatever they want to take away from you. They've taken it away. There's no Jesus, and there's no other way, Peter's saying. There's no other way. None. Not, not a single one. None. Well, what about no? 
church. Well, what about? No. There's none. There's no other name. Now, when they saw the boldness, well, that, 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 now that's what they saw. Peter didn't stand there to speak in tongues because he was full of the Holy Ghost. He didn't give out a message and interpret it to put on a show for him. That's not what he did. That's not what these men saw. He said when they saw the boldness, they were filled with the Holy Ghost and they spoke with boldness and authority. They prophesied and they, they taught Jesus Christ. That's the power of the Holy Ghost. That's the power that you're looking for. If you're looking for power in that, that's where it is. Grab that power up and go out and tell somebody with boldness about the blood of Jesus Christ and what it can do applied to their life. Well, you're judging me. No, don't, let, don't, don't cringe at any of that. Boldness. Be bold. I'm talking to myself. I, I, I'm talking to myself. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. Now what that means is all these men that were sitting here in high authority on the Sanhedrin, it's like a little, it's like an old boys club. Uh, you know what we call down in the south, an old, an old, an old boys club where everybody knows everybody and you can't get in unless you know somebody, blah, blah, blah. That's exactly the way this was. And believe you me, these boys knew everybody in Jerusalem that, that, that did have or wanted because these seats were for life. These seats were there. I mean, they, they, they wanted, there was, there was people all over the place. Anytime you get some kind of power and seat of authority, then there's going to be a scramble to get there. There's going to be men that are going to want it. They're going to want that power. They're going to want that feeling. They're going to want to sit in them chairs. They're going to seek to walk in that room and sit in that chair where them Sanhedrin butts have been for a long time. They're going to want that. So believe you me, these boys knew who was and who was not trained up in the way and, and, and taught the ways that, that needed to be taught for them to come and occupy where they were. So they knew, that's what that means by unlearned and ignorant men. It means that they ain't spent the proper amount of time being spoken to and taught and looked down at by the proper officials that they know and giving them the proper qualified instruction in the letter of the law that they need for them to have so that they can be stand up and preach these kind of things. Sounds an awful lot like seminary, don't it? Sounds an awful lot, I'm telling you. I, you know, I hate, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say this. Well, I'm not embarrassed to say it because I've never been involved in it, but I'm ashamed to say this. I guess I should say, but I've been I've been to, to I've been in situations in different denominations where you get a whole bunch of preachers in a room. I've been in places where it was just just preachers an assembly of preachers, wasn't no kind of vote or anything on it. It was just a bunch of preachers that were sitting in a room. Man, you talk about cock walking and and pecking order. Uh, and, you, and you talk about men strutting around with their chest thrown out and their nose in the air, and these are preachers of the gospel. Proud, proud of who they are. Proud of how big their church building is. Proud of how many hundreds of people they got in their, in their sanctuary on Sunday. Proud of how many services they have every week. We have three services on Sunday morning. We have two services on Sunday night. And then we got something going on every night that they're proud of this. They're, Look and see what I have done. It's awful. It's awful. And that's exactly, that, that's exactly what was going on here. They marveled at them. They knew that they wasn't one of them. They knew the ignorant, unlearned men, y'all ain't one of us. That's what they're saying. Y'all ain't our kind. <clears throat> they marveled. Why? Because they were speaking with boldness and authority. When you speak with boldness and authority and you know what you're talking about, because remember, this is all going back to to Jesus said, they're going to drag you up before the council. They're going to drag you into synagogues and they're going to question you. And he says, don't you worry one little bit about what you're going to say because the Holy Ghost is going to speak for you. So bear in mind, when Peter, Peter's talking, He's speaking with that authority that the Holy Ghost is in him and speaking through him. But the Holy Ghost is also because he can do that because he's got it going on and he's everywhere all at the same time. He's also pricking these men's hearts. And he's talking to each and every one of them individually and he's saying, listen to what he's saying. Listen to what he's saying. Tell me where what he's saying is wrong.
Go ahead and try to think of a way that you can prove these men wrong. Go ahead and think of a way that you can try to convince the masses that this, this man that's, that's standing here healed that's been lame for 40 years. Go ahead and try to figure out a way. See, see how you can warm your way up? He's speaking to them. Same way he speaks to all of us. When we're contemplating or we're in the middle of doing something we shouldn't be doing. It's that voice that's in there going, don't do that. Don't do that. If we're speaking some kind of lie, that's not true. You know, that's not true. That's, what, that's exactly what he was doing to them men and they marveled because the same Spirit was speaking authority and wisdom and truth through Peter. So if you're sitting in... I don't go there. Verse 14. And behold, the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. Couldn't say it. I'm sorry, let me go back. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them or they paid attention. They was paying attention to what I was saying. That they had been with Jesus. Because like I said before, hey, every single one of these guys knew who Jesus was, dealt with Jesus on ba uh, pretty much a daily basis or, or with some form of something that was going on that had something to do with Jesus. Jesus was definitely a thorn in their side that they thought they was done with. But here they're going, hey, here it is back. Not, and, and this time it ain't one. It's a whole gang of them. What in the world? That's what they're thinking. What in the world are we going to do? How are we going to stop? We can't. What are we going to do? That, that's exactly what they were all sitting there thinking. What in the world are we going to do? So verse 15, but when they had commanded them to go outside of the council, they conferred among themselves because they didn't want them hearing what they had to say because you know why? Because they was all going to sit there and throw their hands up and go, what in the world? How are we going to, uh, what, what, what ammunition do we have? We can't say nothing. We can't say that what they're saying is not true. We can't say that the man wasn't healed. We can't say anything about it. There's nothing we can say. What are we going to do? <laughs> That's my God. Verse 16. Saying, what shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest. And it's, and it's, it's obvious. <laughs> it's obvious to all them that dwell in Jerusalem. And we cannot deny it. Why would they want to deny it? Why would an obvious miracle, a lame man that had to be carried to the temple for 40 years, 40 years old, he had to be carried to the temple every day to beg money for a living. Why would they want to deny that this was a miracle from God, that this was the truth? Why? Because men love the dark and they hate the light. We love the darkness and we hate the light. We love the darkness and we reject the light. And then, uh, John 3, let's go real quick. So much for this being quick and getting over with in a hurry. I'm sorry. No, I'm not sorry. John 3, 18 through 21. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. It's already happened. It's over with already. Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. It's done. It's over with. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world. Jesus is saying, this is the problem. This is, this is what's wrong. This is why the, 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 the wrath is already riding and abiding on them. Because light has come into the world talking about himself. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. Neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. If what you're doing and what you're participating in and who you're hanging out with uh, what movies you're going to see, what you're watching on TV, um, how you're taking care of your family, uh, what you're teaching your kids. If all these things are, are godly things, you're going to be proud of them. But if it's not godly things, you're going to hide them. I was talking to a brother just a while ago about this very same thing. This very exact same thing. Men love the darkness and they hate the light. 
They love the darkness and they hate the light. They love to smoke cigarettes. They can't stand the thoughts of lung cancer. That's the truth. They love to drink, but they don't want to think about being an alcoholic and their, and their lives being shattered and ruined. They love shaking them dice and listening to all them chinks and clings and pinks. I've been in the casinos. I know what it's like in there. You shake them dice, you throw them, that's happy times. But then you know, when you're broke and you can't buy groceries and you ain't got food, and, 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 and then you get to the point where you're stealing money from other people so you can go and shake them dice out of desperation. Ain't no joy involved in it then. Ain't no temporary happiness involved in it then, is there? No. We love to get out on the boat and all our buddies and drink a beer on, on a nice Sunday, Sunday afternoon. But then eventually, you're gonna end up out in your garage drinking by yourself with all the doors closed and the lights turned out because your wife's in the house crying her heart out because you went and bought another 12 pack instead of buying a pack of hamburger meat to feed the kids tonight. We love the darkness and we hate the light because our, our things are evil. We don't want nobody to see them. This conversation they was having was not a God is real and he's alive and he's been in the healing business and he's working miracles every day. It wasn't one of them conversations. It was one of them conversations of, you know, our, our power, our seats of authority are in question here because we teach one thing and these guys are teaching directly opposite of what we teach and they've got miracles and signs following them around and we've just got dusty old beards. Their jobs were in danger. That's why preachers don't preach the truth. Their jobs are in danger. They preach the truth. They start preaching about sin and hell. They start preaching about condemnation. They start preaching about the works of darkness are evil and the works of godliness are light. Come out in the light. When they start preaching that way, people leave because they don't want to hear that. It makes them uncomfortable, especially in this day and age. It makes people uncomfortable and they'll leave. They'll pack up, I'll pack my little goodie bag and go home. Either that or they'll go to the people in command and say, look, I pay X amount of dollars in here in tithes. And if you don't change the way you're preaching, you don't change some of the stuff, quit saying some of these things. Because, you know, I got a lot of friends that go to this church. Not only, well, I pack my little goodie bag up and leave, but I'll take my friends with me. That's how those things work. And believe you me, preachers, pastors, don't want to face that kind of thing. Nobody wants to face that kind of confrontation. Nobody wants that kind of people. Nobody wants somebody coming, getting all up in their face and saying, I'm making demands of you and do it. You don't want to do that, so what do you do? You just tone it down, calm it down, take it a little tool, oh, back up, boys. Back up a little bit there, don't be saying these things. And then you look at, at things in the Bible and you say, well, there's some love over here in Corinthians 13. There's some love in uh, John chapter 17 is some love. There's love in a lot of places in here, and there's a whole lot of places where there's righteousness and holiness, and we don't necessarily really need to go because we don't live under the law no more. You know, we're not under the law. We're under grace. <laughs> we got grace. We got love. Jesus, we got love and prosperity. Come, come on in. Come on in, I'll shine my teeth for you. Come on in, I'll write a book every 30 days and you can add to my coffers. Come on in. God loves you. Whew. So in verse 18, and they called them and they commanded them not to speak at all or teach in the name of Jesus. Kind of sounds like America today, don't it? Don't be saying Jesus. Don't say Jesus yesterday. We got a teenager in Tennessee who got suspended from school for saying bless you when somebody sneezed. Because that's on the godly words. We don't speak godly words. That's on the list of godly words that we can't say. We can't say bless you when you sneeze because that, that denotes Christianity because that's primarily a Christian activity. And there might be a Muslim with an earshot. Don't hurt nobody's feelings. Don't speak the truth. Don't get yourself in trouble. Don't get yourself in a situation where you're going to be uncomfortable for all, by all means. Whatever you do, please, don't. 
Don't let anybody speak ill of you. Don't say anything that somebody can take and, and, and go off and, and because people are going to do that, you know. When you say something like that, these whispers, these backbiters, these back diggers, they're going from house to house and telling tales and, and these people, they're, they're paying attention to what you say. So the best thing for me to do is just keep my mouth shut and smile and tell everybody God loves them. And in that way, I don't get in trouble. Yeah, nobody's getting saved. Nobody's hearing the truth. Nobody's getting their toes stepped on. Nobody's getting preached the gospel. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than to God, judge ye. <laughs> but Peter and John said, That's your problem. If you think that I should listen to you instead of listening to what God tells me to do, that's your problem. That's what he's telling them. <laughs> that's, hey, buddy, pal, that's on you. Not me. I'm going to do what God tells me to do. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Peter says, All I know is what I've seen. All I know is what I've heard. What did Jesus say? I don't know anything that I hadn't seen or heard from the Father. What's Peter saying? I don't know anything that I hadn't seen or heard from Jesus. I saw him. I walked with him. I bedded down. We all camped out together. We traveled. We went all over the place. I did all these things. I know him. I know the man. I've seen him and I've heard him. I've seen the miracles. I believe what he says. I feel the power of his presence in me right now. So, hey, pal, that's your problem. If you don't want to believe that what I'm saying is true, that ain't. that's not me. That's you. That sounds awful. That sounds awful. Uh, it's just not very nice. I mean, you can't, you know, you catch more flies with honey than you can with vinegar. I hear things like that all the time. I, now, mind you, I get told, you know, I, I hear quite often that I'm rough and that, that I sound angry and I sound mean, that, 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 that I, you know, I, 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 I get accused regularly of, of sounding and being all these things. And I promise you, I'm not trying to berate or belittle or, 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 Discount. I'm not trying to. That's not what I'm trying to do. That that, that that is not what I'm trying to do. And and I'm I'm not I'm not uh, I'm not smooth and gentle. And I'm not. I don't have a big toothy grin. And I don't. I don't have a way of presenting the Bible that's just all love and sugar cakes and sweetie pie. Because I don't see the Bible as love and sugar cakes and sweetie pie. And 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 I'm also not taking Peter's example here and saying that I'm justified in the way I act and the things I say. We all have to do what we're called of God to do. I don't like being this guy. I told the same brother I told him today, I don't like being this guy. I don't like it. 99% of the time, I am utterly, completely by myself. I don't like that. It's not fun being this guy. It's not fun being this guy. It's no fun, especially in today's age and time, because everywhere you go, everybody is nice and they're consoling and they're sweet and they're sugary and they're all patting each other on the back and they're just, they're, they're, it's just, it's just one big syrupy mess in the world. And then along comes somebody like me who won't back down and change and I'm not going to accommodate people and I'm not going to I'm not going to sacrifice the gospel and the truth of the Bible for friendship of somebody. And what does that mean? Loneliness for me, friends for everybody else. Now I'm not whining. Don't get don't take me wrong. I'm not whining and crying about this at all. I'm, I'm not at all. I'm not. I'm just saying. <laughs> well, actually, what I'm saying is, if you get in line with the Bible. And if you start presenting the utter, absolute truth about the Bible, if you'll get the truth into you so that those rivers of living water will flow out of you, you will find that the exact same thing will happen to you in your life because you will be the one that will be seen as that guy. Here he comes, that guy. Here he comes, the party pooper. Here he comes, the Bible thumper. Here he comes, the wet blanket. Here he comes, the one that's always got something in the Bible to say. We can't have no fun. We can't do this, blah, 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 because here he comes. That'll be you. 
But Jesus said that if you love the world, you're an enemy of God. And if you love God, you're an enemy of the world. And I promise you, the, 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 the will of the church, for the most part, in this day and age, I've made that thing before. You, you draw a line right down this floor, and you say, that's where the world starts. Then the church, instead of being way over here on the other side of the room where they should be, Everybody in the church is fighting and scratching and killing each other to get just as close to that line as they can without actually literally stepping over it. Then if the line is actually six inches wide, you're going to have the loggers step in and explain to the church that, you know, really you've actually got four or five more inches to go before you actually really cross that line. So you can go ahead and, you know, you can go ahead and cut that skirt off a little shorter. You can go ahead and, and, you know, and go out on that. You can go ahead and do any, whatever that sin is that you're wanting to do to justify. You can go ahead and do it just a little bit more because, you know, you're right there on the edge of the line, but there's the line is six inches wide. So you can actually go just a little bit further. A little bit further. That's what the church is doing. And they're fighting and scrapping amongst themselves to try to prove that everything's okay. <clears throat> Verse 21, So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. And in the end... If you choose to bear the cross, if you choose to present the cross, if you choose to present the gospel, and you find that your friend's list is thinning down more and more and more every day, the end is where the payoff is. Not this life. Not this life. The payoff is not in this life. The payoff is when you get to stand before him for the first time. That's the payoff. That's when it counts the most. Bear that in mind. Try to think about that each and every day. Try to live your life like in the next 30 seconds is going to be the first time in the history of you that you get to stand before and look in eyeball to eyeball with Jesus Christ. Because that's when it's going to pay off. That's when, it's, that's when all of that opposition don't matter no more. Every name you've ever been called don't matter no more. Every place you've ever been drugged through don't matter no more. All the despicable, disgusting things that people have said behind your back don't matter no more. Those things don't matter no more. That's it. That's, that, that's the payoff. Just like here. They let them go because there was nothing they could find. One of these days the world is going to let us go. One of these days, the hold that this earth has on us is going to let go, and we're going to go and stand before Him. And we're going to get to look Him in the eye for the first time. Think how happy you're going to be then that you forsook the whole world for His name, for His truth, for His righteousness. Think how happy that's going to make you when you can stand there and that first fleeting thought that runs through your mind at a billion trillion miles an hour, that first thought that runs through your mind is, I am so glad that I forsook the whole world for Him. Because that's the most important moment of your entire existence. It's all gravy after that. We get, you get to stay with Him forever. But it's that first time. That first time. Remember when you got saved? Remember how when, when, you first, when you first came to willing submission to the cross and to the blood of Jesus? Remember how it felt like water ran all over you from the top of your head? To, remember that those chills that you got when you real as a sin and, and the, the bondage and the awfulness and the, 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 the guilt and the shame disappeared from off of your shoulders and it felt like somebody had doused you in cold water. It ran all over you. Remember that? Multiply that by a hundred million million 
when you see Him for the first time and you've forsaken all the world for His name's sake. And compare that with when you see Him for the first time and you've walked as close to that line as you possibly could without going over it. Yeah, you'll still be seeing Him. But I promise you there'll be a difference. I promise you there's going to be a difference. <clears throat> so when they seen when they had further threatened them and let them go, finding nothing, how they might punish them, because the people for all men glorified God for that which was done. For the man was above 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed. In other words, he was old enough. He knew what he's talking about. Everybody knew him. They all saw him all the time. They knew that a miracle, a legitimate miracle had been done. And being let go, they went to their own company. Where'd they go? They went back. Now remember, they'd been gone all night. Remember, this is the next morning. So at some point during the night when they didn't come back from the temple, somebody would have went and found out what was going on. Hey, Peter and John had come home. Uh, we need to go. We need to go see if anything might have happened. I guarantee you they went and found out what was going on. And they uh, found out that they what had happened and they had got locked up and 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 this so they was they was at home praying, I'm sure. I guarantee you they was praying for him the whole time once they found out what was wrong. And they was waiting anxiously for him to come back home. So here they come in and they told him, they told him everything the priests and the elders had said in verse 23 and in verse 24. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which hast made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and people imagine the vain things? The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. Why are they saying here? But they're praying this, and they're saying, they're quoting David. They're bringing David into this. Why are they bringing, why are they bringing David into this prayer? And why this particular thing from David? Psalms chapter 2. See, Psalms chapter 2 in the Bible, if you'll go look in Psalms chapter 2, there's no author listed there because they're not sure it was David. But here, they're saying it is. So this gives credence to the fact that David wrote Psalms chapter 2. So why are they bringing that into this? Because this is exactly what Psalms chapter 2 is talking about. Let's go over this real quick. Boy, did I, <laughs> I will never again say that this video is going to go quick. Psalms chapter 2, verse 1. Why do the heathen rage, and the heathen is nations, Gentile nations, and that rage means to shout or to create a, a tumult. Why do the heathen rage and the people of imagine a vain thing or a void or an empty thing? And we realize here, let's go back to... Uh, in verse 27 of Acts chapter 4, For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles, the nations, and the people of the Israel, the people, were gathered together. So that's what they're doing. They're, they're, they're associating in this psalm of David the nations with the Gentiles, which that's what they are, and the people... Why do the people imagine a vain thing or an empty thing? Or why do they why do they want to believe useless knowledge and forsake the truth? That's what they're asking. Why do they want to do this? Why would they want to? Why would the people of Israel imagine a vain thing? Why why would they not just listen to the truth? Well, let's go on in, in the in the psalm. Uh, verse 2 in Psalms 2. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, who is Christ Jesus, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. In other words, we don't want you. Let's reject God. What is it Paul told us in Romans chapter 1? Those that knew God would not recognize him as God and rejected him as God and worshiped the creation more than the creator. We don't need God. We don't want God. What are we saying in America? Don't say bless you in this classroom because that's on the list of godly language that we can't have. Don't pray in the name of Jesus. Don't speak the name of Jesus. Navy chaplains, you can say anything you want to to anybody that's in the Navy, but don't mention the name Jesus. 
You can't say Jesus out loud. Why? Because there is no other name. When's the last time you heard somebody hit their finger with a... When's the last time you hit your own finger with a hammer and screamed out Moloch or Baal or Dagon or any of those other false gods? None of them because there ain't no power in them names because they're false, dead gods. There's a reason why people hit their fingers and their hands with hammers and scream out Jesus Christ. There's a reason for that because that name has got power in it. That name means something. That name has got authority behind it. And what does Satan want you to do? He wants you to blaspheme to the ultimate nth of degree by using those names of power as curses and slanders and slurs. He could care less about the name of Baal. Those are false gods. Where the power is, that's where the slur is going to come in. That's where the rejection and the blasphemy comes in. That's why they use those words. So here in the verse 3 verses, now, 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 uh, Psalms chapter 2 is, is in 12 verses. And there's four different people speaking here. And you divide it up, the first three, the second three, the third three, and the fourth three. We'll go through each and every one of them. Here in the first one, this is, this is the world speaking. I mean, in verse three, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. What bands and what cords? Religion, spirituality, uh, the law. Let's reject it. Let's do away with it. We don't need God in our life. Starting in verse four, we have God, the Father, speaking. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. What did we read last week or week before in Proverbs 1? He's going to laugh at you. He's going to mock you. When you can, why? Because I've stretched forth my hand and you refused. I have offered you salvation and you have rejected it. I can get to heaven through Buddha. No, because you're rejecting Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so whatever happens to you after you reject Jesus Christ, Proverbs chapter 1 tells us that when that happens, God's going to laugh at you. He's going to mock you. He's saying the same thing here. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. That should make your bones rattle inside of your flesh. That should present terror to you like you have never known terror in your life. The creator of all things. They started this prayer out by giving acknowledgement to you have created everything. Nothing has been created that you didn't create. You have created everything. Ooh, the Lord shall have them in derision. Verse 5, then shall he speak unto them in his wrath. Now remember, he's speaking this in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. What's he going to say? I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Who's he talking about? My only begotten son. My only begotten son. Why is God going to laugh at these people? Because he is sending righteous and holy judgment to the earth to take care of an ungodly, God-hating, cross-hating, blood-hating, Jesus-hating people. That's why he's laughing, because we're a bunch of Mickey Mouse, nothing nobodies down here, shaking our fist at a holy God demanding that he understand the way we think that we should be able to go to heaven because we fed all the homeless kittens and took in all the lost dogs. That's why we should go to heaven. I should go to heaven because I was the mayor of New York City and I made people quit eating sugar and smoking cigarettes. That's what Michael Bloomberg says. He says that when, because of all the things he done for New York City, if there is a God, he said, when I get to the pearly gates, I'm not going to just walk through. He's going to grab me by the collar and snatch me in so fast because he'll be so happy to see me. Listen to the arrogance of mankind in that. 
because he truly believes that. People tell me, if I, if I go to heaven, if there is a God, then he or she, this has been actually said to me before, he or she is going to allow me to come in because I took care of animals and I was nice to people. Arrogance. Arrogance. We worship the creation more than we worship the Creator. You don't have to bow down to a bunch of cats and dogs to worship cats and dogs. I'm not just picking. I'm not picking on people that have dogs and cats. Understand? I'm just. I'm using that as an example. You don't have to bow down to anything to worship it. If it's more important to you than that, I have people tell me a lot of times I'll, I'll have this, and I get a lot of confused looks. And again, I'm being that guy. Because, because saying this makes me that guy. I'll say something about Jesus is coming. I don't want Jesus to come, brother, because I got all kind of family members that ain't saved. That's idolatry, people. That's idolatry because listen to what you're saying. Listen to the arrogance that's built into what you're saying. I don't want God to carry out His will because I don't have all of my family aren't saved. You're elevating your family members who won't refuse and reject to hear the gospel above the will of God. That is idolatry. What happens when you point that out to people in the church? Oh, brother, that's mean. You can't, you don't really truly believe that, do you? I mean, God wants everybody to be saved. He loves everybody, don't He? And, and really, when you get right down to it, we're all sinners, ain't we? He'll understand, won't He? It's idolatry, people. It's idolatry. So here we got God talking. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then he shall speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. In other words, he's going to mess them up in their head. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Verse 7, we got Jesus starts in. The son starts in speaking. Listen to what he has to say. I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. <clears throat> That's Jesus talking, people. He's saying, I'm going to declare this. What did he do when he went into the synagogue and he read Isaiah 61? He declared, this is the acceptable day of the Lord. He has sent me to save the people, to set the captives free, to turn people loose from prison, to take away their bondage. His voice, His word, His commandments, His Bible came to set us free. This Bible is not going to imprison people. It don't bond people up. It sets you free. The truth that's in this Bible sets people free. We can't set people free by keeping the Word of God from them. That's a bondage to, to death. Verse 8, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for my possession. What did we read just a while ago in John? What did we read? I'm going to take what you got away from you and I'm going to give it to a nation that don't. that's not even a nation. You know why? Because they're going to produce fruit. So Jesus is talking here in Psalms chapter 2. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Three times that's in the word. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts for your possession. Thou shalt break. Listen to this. Pay close attention to this. Because it don't say, Thou shalt love them, and, and thou shalt shower them with showers of money and possessions. No, that's not what it says. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. He's going to come, and he's going to rule with a rod of iron. You're not going to go to heaven because you took care of the homeless animals. You're not going to go to heaven because you stood on the street corner and gave away all your money. You're not going to go to heaven because you sold all your possessions and gave it to, to somebody. You're not going to go to heaven for any of those reasons. You're going to go to heaven because you accepted the word of Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. 
that's why you're going to go to heaven. Because the Father drew you to the Son. He gave you the faith to begin with. The Bible says every man is given a measure of faith. Faith is also a spiritual gift, but everybody's given a measure of faith. Why? What's that measure of faith for? So that we would have the ability built into us the faith to believe in God. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. If you don't have enough faith to believe that, then there is no salvation for you to be found anywhere in the Bible. The Bible says without faith it is impossible. It uses that word. Without faith it is impossible to please God. Without faith it is impossible to please God. That's the only way. And those that reject Him are going to be dashed with the rod and they're going to be broken up in little bitty pieces. It's not going to be funny. It's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be happy. In verse 10 through 12, we have the Holy Ghost speaking to us, saying, therefore, or because of all these things that, that have been spoken in verses 1 through 9, the Holy Ghost is saying, pay attention. That's how he starts it out. Be wise now, therefore. What's he saying? Listen to what I've just got through saying to you people in verse 1 through 10. Take heed to what I've just said. Listen to the things that were spoken. Listen to the things that were said. God is going to laugh at you if you reject His Son, His King. Not only is He going to laugh at you when you reject His King, then His King is going to show up and He's going to dash you and beat you with a rod of iron. So the Holy Ghost here in verse 10 says, Be wise now therefore, or because of all that, because of what I've just said, listen up. O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, terror. Look that word up. <clears throat> Serve the Lord with fear, which is terror. And rejoice, rejoice. What do, we, what do we associate with the word rejoice? Be happy, be jubilant, dance a dance. You know, do a little happy dance. Rejoice with what? With trembling. Whew. Lots of fear in here, huh? Kiss the sun, S-O-N. Kiss the sun. Who's the sun? We're talking Psalms here. We're talking Old Testament. We're talking David. We're talking a man that lived a thousand years before Jesus ever came to the earth. A thousand years, David said, kiss the sun. No, there's no Trinity in the Bible, brother. You're mistaken. The Trinity don't exist. <laughs> really? Kiss the sun lest he be angry. Who? The sun? No, his father. God. Kiss the sun lest God be angry. And ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little blessed are all they that put their trust in him who is that whosoever will it's for everybody blessed are all they that put their trust in him and the son what did he say what did Moses say God told Moses, says, I'm going to raise, and Moses told the people, he said, God's going to raise up a prophet among you from among your brethren, just like me. He's going to be like me. And when he raises him up, you're going to listen to what he says. But if you don't listen to what he says, what did he tell them? If you don't listen to what he says, you will be banished from the face of the earth. There's only one way. There's only one way to get there. There's only one path, and it's very narrow, and it's very straight. What does that mean? There's a lots of obstacles. There's a very little narrow path, if you can imagine, imagine that in your mind. There's a barbed wire fence, and you've got a path that's two feet wide, and that's the path you're shooting for. That's the one you've got to go down, and you're all by yourself because it's just a narrow path, and Jesus said also that very few are going to find that path. So once you get to that path, and we're bottlenecking down, down to it, you can see the earth coming in, 
If you'll look at what's going on in the world, we're bottlenecking down into that last time. We're in that last little straightway. So not only is that path only about two feet wide, and I got way more than two feet of belly, so it's a lot harder trek for me than it is for most of y'all. And there's a barbed wire fence on both sides of it. So not only is that it, but now there's big boulders. It's straight. That means there's obstacles. Now there's big old rocks and logs and stuff that I've got to stop and crawl. I can't just run down this path. It's a slow process because I have to go down this path day by day by day. And there's 24 hours in each day. And I have to get down there and these obstacles are going to come up. What does that mean? I'm going to go to leave today and I'm going to have a flat tire. So instead of standing there and cussing like a sailor, I'm going to smile and say, thank you, Jesus, and I'm going to break my stuff out because it's just a bump in the road. It's an obstacle. It's a, a straight. It, the path is narrow and straight. That don't mean it runs in a straight line from point A to point B. It means, it's, it means there's obstacles along the way. you got to work for it. You got to work for it. I told somebody just the other day, the Bible, you can't turn in the Bible, uh, you, you can't pick up the Bible and turn in the Bible to the chapter that tells you everything you need to know about witnessing and to the next chapter that tells you everything you need to know about Jesus and to the next chapter that tells you everything you need to know about the Apostle Paul. The Bible ain't written that way. Why? Because Solomon said way back thousands of years ago that wisdom is like nuggets of gold and silver and they need to be dug at like dug out of the earth. What is he saying? You need to work for it. You got to climb over these boulders. You got to climb over these logs because, and, and you got to do it without, and you're going to get cut because you got a barbed wire fence on both sides of you in this two, two foot wide path. You're going to get cut. You're going to get hurt. You're going to bleed. Your knees are going to get weak and tired. Your back's going to get tired from crawling over this stuff. But I promise you, I promise you, if you stay on the path and you don't give up and you don't turn to the right or turn to the left and you don't turn around and back out of it, that first moment, that first split second when you look him in the eye, it's going to be worth every cut and every bruise and every nick and every sore knee and every sore back and every lost nights of sleep that you spent praying for somebody and every five or ten extra miles that you went because you picked up somebody on the side of the road and they live in a different part of town. Every single one of them nicks and cuts and flat tires, it's all going to, you're going to forget about it. Once you look in those eyes, knowing that you've done the best you could do, because that's all he requires. We can't be perfect. And we're still, uh, even if you do everything we've done, the Bible says we're still an unprofitable servant. But I promise you, I promise you, I promise you, the first time you look in his eyes, you're not going to feel like, he's not going to make you feel like an unprofitable servant. It's going to make you feel like one of His to every single one of us. And it's all going to be worth it. Every single bit of it. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry. Do whatever you got to do to keep God from laughing at you in your calamity and welcoming you with open arms. Peter goes on in verse 28, For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determine for to be done. In other words, again, just like Peter don't miss an opportunity to tell him that they killed Jesus, again, he don't ever miss an opportunity also to say, but you didn't catch God off guard. You didn't do nothing he wasn't looking for. You didn't do nothing that he hadn't planned on happening way a long time because the Bible says that he was the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. If you look in Psalms 139, David says that every, get this, get this in us. We, we need, if we could get this in us, if we could believe this, if we could really, really, really get a handle on this, look at the stress and the worry it would take away from everybody. David says in Psalms 139 that every single day that we live, every day by day, he says continually, he uses the word continually. I forget what verse it's in. But he says every single day of our life <clears throat> was written down in a book from the foundation of the world. 
If you knew that what you was going to be going through next Thursday was written down in a book 6,000 years ago, and you could get that into us, if I could get that in, wrap my head around that, then I could truly, truly, truly be set free from any kind of bondage that the enemy would try to put on us. Because we don't do anything, and we don't have anything done to us that God doesn't already know about. And we have that promise right here. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, remember they're praying. This is a prayer. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness that we may speak thy word. No matter what happens to us, just give us the ability to speak your words. Man, if we could all just be that way by stretching forth thy hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of the holy child Jesus. Now, this, the, in verse 27 and here in verse 30, that, that's translated child. Um, if you'll go and look in the, in the thing, you'll see that that word is used 39 times in the Bible. It's translated child these two places right here and all 37 other times it's translated servant. I have no idea why this word servant was translated child here. But, you know, I've, I've got no comment on that either way. Verse 31, And when they prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Yes, they did. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And great power gave the apostles witnesses, and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Notice with great power, they had that power, and they used that power to give witness to the resurrection of Jesus, not for anything else, to give witness, boldness, to speak the word of God. Neither was there, verse 34, neither was there any among them that lacked for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. Now again, like I said last week, this is not some kind of hippie commune kind of thing. you got to understand there's 5,000 of these people and it's an absolute, absolute brand spanking new thing. It's a brand spanking new thing. These people were trusting, they were believing, they had received their salvation, they were rejecting, think about this, they were rejecting everything they'd been taught all their lives, and they were accepting what these apostles were saying. Well, of course they're going to want to stick together and stay close together, because they're giving up everything. I mean, I mean to this day, to this day, if a Jew accepts Jesus as Messiah, his family, they have, a, they have an actual legal contract a thing that they a process that they go through, and, and they legally reject that child from their family. It literally is, if, if a Jew gets saved, his family, if they go and do this, they have a legal process they can go through that's puts that child in a position of the, the like they had never even been born. And, and, and these people were the same way. They were, they, they were being rejected by all, everything they knew and everybody they knew. Just like, I mean, you know, you know how it is when you, when you first get saved? A lot of us have that experience. You get saved and you start telling people, hey, let me tell you about Jesus. Oh, my you and really? I, know, I thought, I didn't think it ever happened. I didn't think you'd ever get sucked into that. I don't think, and we've all been there. We've all had friends and then people that knew us that told us that. Even now, when you say, well, you know, the Bible says so and so, oh, really, I don't, that, I, I, that's, that can't be what the Bible means because I think or I feel or I, <clears throat> I don't think God would, whatever. I, you know, we, we get that rejection now, we're rejected. It's reject, they were rejected of people. So they weren't hippie communing it up, they were just sticking together. It dispersed out. They didn't set up a commune there in Jerusalem that still exists today. It wasn't that kind of thing. It didn't exist, you know, for very long at all. They started spreading out. 
We started getting comfortable. It's like everybody else. You get comfortable in your salvation. You start speaking the word. You get empowered and filled with the Holy Ghost. And you're going around and witnessing. And people are getting saved. And just like it said in the last chapter, and God is adding to the church as he sees fit every day. And, and eventually it all spread out. But for the time being, remember, where Luke is trying to explain all the things that happened and went around the beginning, the very beginnings of the church, the body of Christ, after Christ was ascended. So they're all kind of sticking together. They're not, it's not a, it's not a commune. Verse 36, And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, and, and, the, and the other verse is, talks about all the people were selling their stuff, and, and, but they pointed out this one guy in particular. And the reason they pointed out this guy beyond this, that everybody was living together and selling all their stuff, Barnabas, uh, either you know or you don't know, will come into play later on because he's, he, he ends up being a traveling companion with Paul. And we'll know and learn and hear a, a lot more about Barnabas later on. But that's why Joseph, who was surnamed Barnabas by the apostles, by the way, it says the apostles surnamed, and by who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas. They named him Barnabas. They changed his name, the son of consolation. Uh, having laid, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Um, I did not. I don't know how long this video is, and I did not intend for it to be to go that long. But I do not apologize for it. If you've stayed stuck with it until now, God bless you. Um, and, um, I, I hope that you're learning as much as I'm learning. I hope that you're getting as much out of this as I'm getting out of this because believe you me, I have never, I have never, I was raised up, per, per, pretty much raised up in, in the Pentecostal church around Pentecostal people and I have never read the book of Acts uh, like I'm reading it now. I'm not saying that's anti-Pentecostal, I'm just saying that the, the, the Pentecostal belief and doctrine centers around the book of Acts, but I've never heard it taught and explained the way that the Lord is revealing all this stuff to me and the new understanding and learning. So I hope that you're learning as much as I'm learning. I hope you're enjoying this as much as I'm enjoying it because I've said it before and I'll say it again. I'm having a ball. So until next week, Lord willing, God bless you greatly. And until then.